This is the second part of the lecture for the data visualization and dashboards. Now we're going to start talking about the processes behind it to make this an integrated, continually self-monitoring uh, element of your business. Not just creating a dashboard and going away, but this talks about the, we'll talk about the business process management functions. We'll talk about Six Sigma and the different ways that we can tie all these things together to not just dashboards and reports, but a continual process to make things better and bring the BI platform to where it needs to be as an organization. Um, the operational planning. So this is that taking that strategic vision and making it a reality. Uh, we want to be the best grocery chain in North America. Well, that's great. That's a great strategic vision. How am I going to do that? That's what operational plans come in. I'm going to be I'm going to put all the, we're going to have the most uh, items on the shelf. We're going to be, and be careful, so we're not going to say, we're, we don't want to be the low cost seller, but we're going to be economically sold, we're going to be priced correctly so that people are willing to spend, okay, I can go to Remkin, now Remkin's bags are expensive, I can go to Walmart and get it for 15 cents cheaper, but is that really worth my drive to go to Walmart when I can go to Kroger or I like the other thing, so I'll pay the extra 15 cents or 5 cents, I don't know, what the, it depends on what the product is. But, so you don't necessarily always have to be lowest cost, but you've got to be priced correctly. And those type of things are going on. So the operational plan is what allows you to take a, that strategic vision and make it something that can be a tactical uh, operation that you can actually do. I can't, if I would go Tell anyone here, it's, it's, I always pronounce your name, Basil. Yep. Get it right? Hey, that's one for me. <laughs> so if I came to you and said, I want you to make the best sandwich ever, you're going to make the best sandwich ever, and that's all I left with, would you, what would you do? Would you have an idea of what to do, how to make the best sandwich ever? No. I mean, I, you couldn't operate, but that's not something that says, hey, that's good. If I said, no, if I came to you my set, and I said, Hey, we're going to be the best uh, ham sandwich ever. You might have a little bit of focus on what you can do, but so you got to be really careful in that regard. So, uh, and, and then if that's the case, then you can start doing the operation. Okay, well, I mean, I need to go get the best producers of ham. I need to get the best producers of bread because that's a sandwich, I guess, or whatever. So, I mean, there's things you can do, but you got to be careful that you link those operational and the strategic together. And be, be very aware that no matter what the people tell you, even in nonprofits, money always matters. Uh, I've used this before. There's an old saying, if you ask the question long enough, the answer is money. And that's very, very true. So if you keep asking the question somewhere along the line, money, money's involved. Even like I said, even if it's a nonprofit, even if it's like the United Way or whatever, or Henry Jose House, or pick, pick your favorite uh, charity, Meals on Wheels, whatever it might be, ultimately they make decisions because money drives things in this economy. So you, you, you may not be the main focus of what you do, it may not be that ultimately a term, but it will, it will have an effect on it. So always be aware of the budgets and those uh, things that you need to be aware of for your operations. So, and then there's the monitor analyze. You need to put something together that allows you to how can I monitor, so again, like I said, sales. And I, if, if I mentioned, mentioned this last week, I apologize. So right now in the grocery industry, they have something called ID sales. It's been, that's just a, the grocery, it's all retail. ID sales being comparing this store at this time versus a year ago. So we'll pick, I'll pick Kmart this time since they're going up business. Kmart would measure themselves and say, okay, this Kmart in Edgewood, Kentucky, we sold a million dollars worth of products uh, in the fiscal week 10 this year. How does that compare to fiscal week 10 a year ago? So that, that measurement is called ID sales, identical sales store to store. So, and this is a, a probably good, Kmart, so in the grocery industry, which I know better than the others, the grocery industry, 3% is usually considered the, if you're doing 3%, you're doing good, okay? If you're doing more than 1%, it's probably okay. If you're in a 2%, pretty good, not great. If you're over 3%, fantastic. So Kroger, 
we're, we're, we're looking at, we're monitoring, and our ID sales are at 2.2% for the last quarter. And people are high-fiving it and going on that stuff. And I think I might have mentioned, I, I mentioned Nashville. Nashville specific. In Nashville, Tennessee, they've got a 3% ID sales, 3.1%. And it was like, man, you guys are just rocking it. You're, you're, you're killing it. Keep up the good work. Let's give Joe a bonus. Well, the only problem was all the other stores in Nashville market, the Walmarts, the Publix, whoever the hell else is in Nashville, I don't even know, they're, they're operating in about a 45 to 5% market. So you've got to be careful that you're chasing those things if you're not looking at the right things. So you're monitoring it and you're thinking, hey, this is good. We're, our monitoring point is 3% and anything over that, we're doing great. When in reality, we should have been looking at the market and looking at the, what the market's doing. So 3%, while it's still not terrible, Compared to 5%, it's not so good. So you got to be real careful that when you're monitoring things, you're monitoring the right things, and you have a way how you're going to monitor. So that's, that's I was kind of the how to monitor. So that in that, it's not measuring, even though the, the overall metric is ID sales, you might care more about region sales. What's the region sale? How am I compared to the region or to my area or whatever it might be? With that, it's after... Let's take a 10 minute break. We'll be back here at 7.30. So, the part of what you need to do, to how, how to adjust, what, what to change. Um, there's, this, there's another saying, and I'm not, I hate to sound like I'm all these quotes, but if you're not changing, you're dying. So if you're not adapting, you're dying. So if, you, if you're a biologist, they'll tell you throughout the world's evolution how things have changed, species that adapt and adjust survive. Those that don't struggle. Um, companies, if you don't, and I may mention this, go, if you want to see an interesting thing, go take a look at the Fortune 50 from 20 years ago. Start at 50 years ago, start at 50. You're probably going to look at it. You're not even going to, for you guys, you probably won't even recognize the companies. Then look at it from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. It's an amazing. And see, the companies that change are the companies that have stayed. There's not many that stay in that level. In fact, um, you know, if you go back to 50 years, there's not a whole lot of those guys in place, in the, especially if you get in the, like the Fortune 20, 25. Some of them are. But that you, you have to adapt and change. So that's one of the things, just make sure you're able to do it and change your processes when you're um, doing your review of things. Recognize that um, not everything's going to work. In fact, on the contrary, you have more failures than you have successes in business, quite honestly. And, and this is another buzzword. The big trend now is fail fast. It's okay to fail, but don't spend two years and two billion dollars and fail. Spend six months and a million dollars and fail, and then that's not a fail. And then the other buzzword is there's no failures, there's just learning and success. So if I didn't do it, I, I'm learning, and I'm going to be more successful. Now the reality is, if you have too many of those learning opportunities, you don't stay around for any successes, and that's just reality. But one of the things you have to do is try to figure out what your chances are, what the reality is. Now, again, Hollywood, 60% of all Hollywood movie projects fail. Is anyone familiar with how Netflix really, not how it got started, but what made, what changed the trajectory of Netflix? It was all on data. So Netflix had all this data about what movies that everyone likes, and all that stuff. So in television, the standard for television was to do these things called pilots. Have I mentioned this before? So pilots, they go out, and someone comes with a movie idea, and they go get the actors, they get the directors, and they go film like two or three episodes, sometimes just one episode. But they spend millions of dollars, and there would be like 900 pilots a year created. And like 13 of them make it to TV. Of the 13, usually about at least half, if not more, don't make it through the entire first season. So you have, for four or five television shows that are successful, and I can have numbers off by one or two, but you get the picture, is they spent literally millions, if not billions of dollars on all these pilots that never, never see the light of day, never make it. 
Well, Netflix decided they, they couldn't, they didn't have the pot, the money that NBC, ABC, TNT, CBS, whatever the networks are. So they said, we're going to do it differently. We have this data that tells us what movies you like, what television shows you like. So what they started doing, one of the correlations they found immediately was a cor correlation of movie actor, movie director, and topic. Those three things together. A movie actor, along with a, direct, a director of a certain type, and a content come up with. So they created a movie called House, or they created a concept of the show called House of Cards. House of Cards, um, they did not, they didn't even have a script when they hired the actor, the director, sorry, they hired all those people from scratch with an idea because their research told them political dramas at the time, it's probably changed now, Kevin Spacey was like one of the hottest guys going. I don't know who the director is, but whoever the director was, was the guy. So those three things, political, Kevin Spacey, and the director were this house, and Kevin Spacey, by the way, was willing to do it. Some of the other actors who felt that thing weren't willing to go do this and kind of put it in there. Because his initial money he was going to get was not as high as it would have been if he would have gone down to a regular movie or television shows. It was going to be less, but his potential, if it was higher. Well, needless to say, that was a huge success. And then they followed that footprint for all these other dramas. So that's what they do with their dramas is, in their shows, is they do this research and let the, the data tell them what shows I pr should produce. And they go ahead and they don't produce one or two. They produce like 14 episodes. Because a lot of that sunk cost, one of the problems with uh, the whole pilot thing is you get all this money in place and you do two episodes and then it's canceled if you've spent a lot of money and you, you've probably had to commit to at least a certain amount of pay to a certain amount of people to get them to do it. Well, so now Netflix is generating shows that, which, are, by the way, have a hit ratio of like 80% compared to like whatever 5 out of 900 is. So that, and they did it all based on data. So they were able to adapt and change because they could not compete with people on the same, on the same, it wasn't a level playing field for them. They didn't have the money and they didn't have some of the resources the other places did. But now, so what's happened now is guess what the, the networks and everybody's doing. So now you see it everywhere. Amazon's done the same thing. They're all copying after, in fact, to the point that Netflix no longer has a competitive advantage anymore because everyone's kind of jumped on that thing. But when we talk about IT in, in particular, Large IT projects fail at a higher rate than normal projects. Because one reason is IT projects are going to probably be more cutting edge, leading edge. They're also going to be more risky. But the also is that um, for whatever reason, I don't know the exact answer to this, is that IT prep projects do a terrible job of monitoring themselves. Did. That's kind of changing now. The whole event, it, I'm not trying to be a project management class, but agile has kind of changed a lot of that. So it used to be, you know, you do a project, it'd be a year and a half project. Well, what you started to do uh, last January, and now it's a year and three months later, the business needs change. So what you went out, with, you know, what you were planning on doing is no longer a valid thing anymore. So, and that's what Agile has done. But it, the reason that's important is you need to know that you have to be able to monitor to that and have a way to make sure that you are comparing are I on the right path? Am I doing the right things to be successful and move forward? Because if you're not, that's okay. And that's the other thing that has changed is, and it's not completely changed yet, but there's always a culture of, hey, if I'm the person in this project and it fails, that's a black mark on me. And now I'm going to be, I'll be, you know, cleaning the toilets or sweeping the hallways or worse, I'll get fired kind of philosophy. That's changed a little bit. In fact, Stephen Jobs helped change that culture a little bit. Think, so again, Stephen Jobs, the guy from Apple, if you take a look at all the things he did, he failed a lot more than he was successful. You know, the, if you've never heard the story, this goes back to when I was just starting, you know, he had this, uh, when he introduced, I think it's a Mac, I could have the wrong one, the, the original one, 24 hours before he was going to have this at this big show and have the whole world look at it, it wasn't working. It did not work. So basically, he ended up, they ended up spending their time, and it was all smoke and mirrors. It didn't really work the way he was proposing to work. But he was a big success. Made lots of, they made lots of money on the product, failed, and it never made it because it couldn't do it. But Stephen Jobs never gave up. He just came, kept coming back and kept doing it. And ultimately, he was 
extremely successful, financially anyway. But you have to be careful that people, so everyone should not want to fail, and that's never your goal, you don't want to fail, but you can't put a culture in place that allows, if you fail, that's it. You, don't, you should, people should be able to fail. Now, if you fail doing the same thing multiple times, that's a different story. You know, you'll fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me kind of philosophy. But failing is okay as long as, again, if you learn from that and you change how to do it. And for whatever reason, IT projects have always struggled with that. So you need to make sure that you're comparing and making sure that the progress you're making is consistent with where you're going. If you don't do that properly, you have issues and you're going to continue to fail and not be successful. And that's all part of that performance measurement, make sure you're measuring. So again, the reason I'll tell you is sometimes people will measure websites. How many clicks do I get on the website might be a measurement that people care about. Okay. That may be the, and so they may come out of there after the first week, month, and say, man, this was a great success. We've got all this traffic. We've got all these clicks. But the real measurement might be how many of those people come back next week. Not the first time. People will go burn around so they get all excited. And that's what they're measuring. So they, they go down and they continue to do more of what they were doing. And they build on further. Well, the reality is that people weren't interested enough to come back next week. So now you've continued to build more of something that people aren't going to come back to. So now you've spent more money, more things. So, and that's just one analogy, one scenario where that happens. You got to be very careful that you're measuring the right things and you're uh, keeping abreast of what's important for that project. And it's not going to be the same for every project. But that's that's why the performance measurement is so. So we talked about the KPIs, um, and you can look at this video. I'm not going to go show this YouTube video here. Uh, the KPI should be, as we mentioned earlier, should be key to what your company strategy. So if your KPIs aren't keying into your strategy, your targets, and they don't have a range, you don't, you can't, if all your KPIs are, are uh, black and white, either I success or I fail, you've got a problem. Because you can't, if it's success or failure, it's tough to improve because the only thing that get you there. But if you can measure and say, listen, we didn't get that 10% uh, sales growth, but we got 7.5%. Okay, that's, that's improve upon that. So that's, that's, you want to make sure you have ranges of things and don't make it be a all or nothing type of thing. Now some people, the purists will tell you that that's a better way to do it, that it's a, a fail or, or, or die kind of scenario, but that's, it's better off if you have ranges. And it's better off if you have benchmarks to uh, kind of, for lack of a better term, uh, try out what your measurements are. So you're, you're, you're going to benchmark certain things so that you know that you're going forward in the right place. Those are all key elements as you're doing it in your, in your operational metrics and making sure your operational metrics and your key performance indicators align. So you're going to have outcomes and drivers. So the, in, the, in the finance world, they call them lagging and leading. So, as I mentioned before, if you're looking at everything that's outcome-based, how was my sales, uh, you got a problem. Because by the time you see that, it's too late. The driver KPIs, the leading indicators, if it's number of households coming, if it's the number of viewers, if it's whatever, those are the things that are going to tell you. And if those are going bad, guess what's probably going to happen? Your outcomes are going to go bad. So you need to make sure you have a good balance of taking a look at your uh, leading indicators and your lagging indicators. Is anyone here in sales? Usually not. So in sales, think about it. traditionally, people have always measured sales, and this happens a lot. They measure sales literally in how many, you know, what sales do you have? How how much have you increased your sales? And that's the only way they have it. it's an outcome-based thing. And so you get. Um, you get nice commissions, but sometimes sales can just flat out be pure luck. You can go into a company and they happen to need what you're selling. You might be a crappy salesman, but people will buy it. So that guy, they give him a big bonus, you're promoting. Or you got another salesman who maybe just by the luck of the draw or whatever, the people he was going to didn't have at that, but he's doing all the right things. He's making the, the follow-up visits. He's, he's building the relationship with the customer. But guess what? Those guys don't survive at the outcome-based Companies, they get rid of them. 
I'll pick one. I hope no one works with TQL. TQL, great company, but it is an outcome-based scenario. So if you're not familiar with TQL, it's a third-party logistics company, really good company, it does great. But they measure their sales guys on how many um, trucks they, uh, how many truckloads they sell, how much, how profitable they are. At the end of the day, though, what happens is it becomes a commodity business. So you can be successful for a period of time, but then another company comes and undercuts you by five dollars, and guess what? They jump over to that guy. They don't care. So they're outcome based. But you should, and, and I should say, because they care about like they care about how many phone calls you make. They care about how many return things you have. But that's what you have to measure is you have to do a balance of outcome and leading indicators. Otherwise, you're going to either be fat, dumb, and happy when things go uh, bad, it's too late. The leading indicators, also you can't, the, ultimately you do have to care about outcomes. So I'll pick Kroger. You know, Kroger, we can do all the things we think is right. How many, how many people are coming to our website? How many people sign up for our loyalty program? But if we're not getting sales, we're missing a piece somewhere. Yes? Is there a general That's a very good question. I, um, so the rule of thumb used to be five. Some people have expanded that to seven, but the key there is um, making sure it's balanced. So you could have, some people think you can have, so that there's, again, an argument. Some people think you can have five of each. You can have five leading, five, I, the, human, the human brain. So does anybody know why the social security number is the length it is in the United States? Because the human brain, when you get beyond that, can't comprehend it. So that, so if you have anything more, they, they purposely split it up for lots of reasons, but if you go beyond that, people, they won't comprehend it. So you don't want to have double digit. You don't, if you're going to have a 10 would be absolutely, in my opinion, my, my opinion should be seven or less. That, that's my opinion. Other people would argue that. Some people say, no, you can have multiple, but when you start getting over this, you just can't focus. There's only so much you can focus on as an organization uh, at one time. So I think when you're trying to get too many of those out there, you end up, you know, the old, if you're focusing on, focusing on 10 things, you're focusing on no things. You're, you're much better off. In fact, again, the, the, the guys who came in and were working with Kroger on this, they were the other way around. They said, we think threes. Three and two, or two and three is what you should do. Your five should be, and you should have the leading, you should have the outcome base, but it should, if they think it's five. Now, they're not, the gurus necessarily, but they're pretty good. I'm trying to think of the name of the company, the guys out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they're pretty well thought of in the industry. And so their, their point is five, that companies, especially bigger companies, you need to focus. Some people will tell you that smaller companies need to be less. The smaller companies need to find out what's important for them and focus on that now. I will argue that what happens with companies that, small companies that don't focus on one or two things, now let's, let's say they're outcome based, and there's like their sales, their sales is what they're doing. They end up becoming a house of cards in that they don't have anything to back that up ultimately, and they, they have it, so. But I would say seven is a fair number, and I don't think a lot of people would argue with me on that, but some people say that's too many as well. But the key though is having a balance of leading indicators and lagging indicators, or in the I a lot of times, these are the absolute sales, and these are the activities. And that, that's easy in sales, but even if it's, again, it's a nonprofit, if it's um, hospitals, if, if one of your indicators is this, it's probably a satisfaction survey or a number of people that come to you first, th those things you need to look at. Because you know, if you're St. Elizabeth, let's face it, if you're St. Elizabeth, who are you compete with in Northern Kentucky? You could be with people in Cincinnati for sure, but Northern Kentucky, Who's the other hospital? There's one. There's not another hospital chain in Northern Kentucky. So they have to make sure that they're looking at the right things to, to, to do it. To their credit, they do a good job of recognizing the situation. And they weren't always that way. There used to be St. Luke, used to be other hospitals, but they've kind of just gone away because of that. So, but again, and you want to make sure that these are some of the areas you look at when you're looking at the, your KPIs, customer performance, your service, your sales, your forecast. It's really important to have a, uh, that your forecast is, and this is where, by the way, we'll go now, but we get into artificial intelligence and machine learning. Forecast is one of the biggest things it's using that for, because it's really important to have a good, solid forecast.
Because if your forecast is bad, all your planning is bad. All your outcome predictors are bad. So again, back I picked on Kroger. Kroger says our sales forecast is three percent, and you're doing great. And hey, we're doing three percent. Our, our forecast was wrong. Our forecast should be the market, not not the ID sales of the industry. It should be the market. So now we're, we're focusing on ID sales of the market you're in versus ID sales of the industry. Now. It doesn't change that overall for Kroger, 3% ID sales is really good. And if we did that, we'll, we'll be all very happy. But if you're in Nashville and other emerging markets where it's growing, you can't be happy with 3%. That's because that's not good enough. So, and I, I wish I could tell you there's a absolute game plan to, to pick which are the right ones. It's, it's going to vary, and that's where you have to use the gray matter. You, you, you trust your leaders to go do the right things. So the last thing we'll talk about is the balance, not the last, but the balance scorecards. Um, the balance scorecards kind of goes back to the same thing. Is so you don't want to have, you want to have something for a little bit. You want to have an HR component of it. How many, how many peop people, what's the average length of stay at, at our company? What's the uh, average, what's the, sat if you do satisfaction surveys, are they improving? Are they getting worse? Uh, what are sales? What are our how many new products are we developing? Whatever it might be for your company, but you want to balance it out. You don't want to be too far down on things. This is just part of that performance measurement, the balance scorecard. This was this was a buzzword for years, and now actually this is kind of going away. The balance scorecard has almost become just another word for dashboard. So the dashboard though is telling you that you want to make sure you have things from. You don't want to focus all on finance. You don't want to focus all on manufacturing or on sales. You want to have a balance for your whole company and, and do it. And this is kind of what you're talking about. They're talking about here is you want to have all that stuff together. So you're looking at financial. You're looking at customer. You're looking at your internal processes, whatever it might be. You want to make sure all those things are being measured and you're being and uh, you're concerned with. So we just talked about the balance scorecard. Now we're talking about Six Sigma as a way to measure the system. Six Sigma, if you're not aware of it, is a uh, performance management methodology that uh, is a lot of times associated with GE. They're kind of one of the big drivers in this area. It's a uh, based in statistics. It, it, it has its roots out of total quality management and Dr. Deming's work all the way back into the late 40s and early 50s with Japan when he was rebuilding Japan. So it's it's a key element. It's uh, a lot of growth in this area. There's a lot of companies, and you'll talk. They'll talk about Six Sigma certifications. You get black belt certifications. It's another measurement capability of looking at how you are doing as a company and how you're doing as an organization. Um, it, again, a uh, closed loop process that allows you define, you measure, you analyze, and prove. And that's the Lean Six Sigma is. Another version of the Six Sigma and the fact that it's saying lean, so if you're not familiar, lean is kind of the thing, get back to no waste. You just make it simple. You're, you're just trying to get rid of it. If there's waste, if you're, if you're making a, a metal part and you're losing 20% of the metal as, as, as you're cutting into it, they're saying that's too much. You've got to change your process. You, you've got to get down that to be, instead of 20%, maybe that needs to be 3%. So you're always processing, trying to be lean, make things more efficient. Um, and that those are all things that are all part of the performance management. Six Sigma is kind of the, the most well known of those. But having said that, guess what they use? They use dashboard. Now the Six Sigma guys will tell you, and that this may have changed. I've been around these guys in a while. Was you couldn't do them with you couldn't do your charts with a tool. They wanted you to draw your charts. They wanted to literally like take a, a magic marker and do it. They thought that was part of the process. And I think that's somewhat changed. But that's what they. And you, but you would hang them up every day. So every day you'd go, or every week, however you were measuring it, they would literally go create their charts. And part of the process of them doing it was to make sure they realized that things were right and also they're measuring the right things. But Six Sigma is all part of this whole process. And if you want, that the video will have more about it. But Six Sigma, again, is um, kind of a measurement in, in almost now synonymous with how dashboards are done. And here's what they're talking about, the balance scorecard. Um, they're very, very similar in a lot they do. Um, the difference with uh, Six Sigma is versus a balance scorecard is there probably is uh, a more 
direct relation to profitability in Six Sigma than you're going to have with some of the other balanced scorecards. But again, Six Sigma was meant, by the way, to the different people who have adapted to it, Six Sigma is designed for manufacturing. That, that's where it was designed. So it has a different, so where balanced scorecards were not. Manufacturers have it, but Six Sigma literally was designed to be for manufacturing in the whole process. Um, so, as you can see, there's a lot of the things they're saying. Uh, there's some differences, but they're, they're very similar in the fact that they are a, a performance measurement method and the way you do it. So, um, the other thing is that uh, I'll mention on the second last one is that in a balanced scorecard, is that you want to use this as a way to uh, communicate and kind of visually show and get feedback from people on your strategy and how you're approaching it. Or Six Sigma, they don't really care about the feedback part. The management will do that. Um, they're going to put whatever processes they think is important out there. It's not looking for feedback or for validation. That's not a major part of Six Sigma. Where Spout Scorecard is kind of the, one of the underlying thoughts on that is, is you're getting feedback, you're changing it more often. Where Six Sigma, they're going to let management or people from the top kind of determine that.